Yeah. No, just don't join with audio. I'm saying hearing you. Yeah, can you close out, leave, and then go back in? Okay. And when you enter, it should ask you. It doesn't ask you. Okay, just me. Yes. They, um, hello, hello. People hear me? Yes, we can. Beautiful. Hello. Yep. Robin, if you could mute. I think I am muted. Oh, I think I think I Anyone who is in the auditorium who is connected to Zoom needs to leave computer audio. Robin is disconnected from audio, so she doesn't have to worry about it. I see that Dory is disconnected from audio, but Denise Menino is connected to audio. Paul Smith is. How do I disconnect from oh, audio? Oh, I should disconnect from audio. Yeah. Yes, I think it's called leave, audio, leave computer audio. Yeah, got it. It, it just says leave meeting. Okay. So headphones icon with an arrow pointing up yes at the top it's the same i think yeah, it's the same go thing in on the bottom left so mark i went out and i'm going back in i'll just say the, the kind of right paper thing paper. don't connect the audio that's correct Paper. What kind of paper is it? It's just different. Okay. Um, maybe it's uh, the paper you use because... when you're doing sheet rock to cover the. Oh, to cover the seams. Oh, it's beautiful. That's right. That's awesome. It's perfect. You'll see when you see it. I mean, you you won't know what it is. Join with. I don't want to join. All with. the content. Yes, if it, if it asks you to join with audio, just click the X on that. It doesn't say. It just says it join with video. This is different. Um, is she on an iPad? It's it's MacBook. Yeah. A MacBook Pro. Okay, hang on one second. Let me come. 
Oh, that's what I have. Let's see, like mine. so next to the um, the microphone button. There's a little up arrow. If you click that, you should have an option for leave computer audio. You're talking about on the program itself? Yes, on, on the Zoom. Um, down in the bottom left-hand side is a microphone button. And we there's a little arrow just next to the microphone button. You'll click that. And one of the options is leave computer audio. Oh. There we go. Super. All right. That clock is very wrong. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'd like to go ahead and call to order this meeting of the Sustainability Committee of the City of Tarpon Springs, Thursday, March 18th at 6.03 p.m. I would like to make a motion that those who are unable to attend due to extenuating circumstances, Karen Gallagher and- but Each individually. Uh, can join the meeting and vote as a member of the committee. Do we have a second? Am I voting this time? Second. Okay. Is it since there's two absent? Was am I voting? Yes. Uh, they're going to be right now. We're we're making the creating the motion to allow them to participate and vote. Right. Well, you so that should motion. be one, two, three, four, five. So no. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we need. Uh, actually, do we need to wait for Ashley if she's taking minutes? I'm doing. This. Or you are. Okay. Okay. So then we need a, a vote. All in favor, aye. 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 I'd like to make a motion that Taylor Mandalu be able to participate in the meeting. He's not here due to extenuating circumstances and that he would be able to vote as a member of this committee. Second. In favor, aye. 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 Okay, thank you for that. So let's go ahead and go to roll call. Okay, Chairperson Dory Larson. Present. Vice Chairperson Paul Robinson. Present. Member Taylor Mandalu. Present. Member Denise Menino. Present. Member Karen Gallagher. Present. Alternate number one, Robin Sanger. Here. Alternate number two, Dr. Carol Mickett. Present. Okay. All right, moving on to item number one, the approval of the January 21st, 2001 minutes. Uh, can I get a motion to approve that or a motion to amend the minutes? Dory, I'd like to uh, make a, uh, actually question and then make an amendment if we need to. On page three, when the land, land development code is abbreviated, I believe further down it's abbreviated incorrectly, the C and D are transposed, um, unless we're talking about something completely different on that portion. Not in the third paragraph? I, I believe so. Oh, it's, it says LCD twice? Correct. Is that, is that meant to be the land development code where it should be LDC? Correct. Okay. That was my only um, question on that. Thank you for that. So then um, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the minutes with that correction. Uh, so moved. Second. All in favor, aye. 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 All right, thank you. Moving on to our next item on the agenda. It is the um, discussion about the land development code, um, looking at an updated approach for providing input. And I'm gonna hand it off to Paul Smith to talk about that. Okay, thank you. I've been busily taking notes over here. So could you give me a prompt again on the item? I don't have the agenda in front of me. Sure, it's item number two. It's discussion for the land development code. Oh yes, thank updated you. Updated approach for providing input. Thank you. 
Yeah, so based on the feedback we've been receiving, and it's been appreciated actually from the various members of this committee, um, I'm going to propose something. I've spoken with the Planning and Zoning Director, Renee Vincent, about an approach that we can get your input on this land development code, comprehensive plan, strategic plan, all of this together in a way that um, I think we can all get there more efficiently. And, and what I'm gonna to suggest to you for your consideration is to keep a running list, um, each member as you're going through particularly this framework of areas of land development code, et cetera, that you want addressed. And this can be as simple or as detailed as you want it to be. I'll give you an example. Say we're working through um, natural systems and you come across wetlands and you say, you know what, this is important to this community. I think that this needs to be represented in the land development code. You could just put it on your list as wetlands if you want to get in more detail that than that and say, I want a 50 foot buffer around all wetlands, I'm just giving you examples, then you put that level of detail. The idea would be that you each have a running list at some point, perhaps when we've worked through all of these goal areas of the framework, we get together and try to do a consensus type of, you know, narrow that thing down. So the final product might be a memorandum from this committee to planning, zoning, city manager, board of commissioners, if you'd like, but it gives them your thoughts, your direction, recommendations on the areas that need to be addressed in the land development code. So I'd like to turn that over for thoughts. You know, originally when we started out, I was picturing everybody typing in red line comments. I think we all began to realize pretty quickly it's much more complicated than that. And it's not my intention for each of you to turn into lawyers. You know, and, and working on it's very complicated the way it's all put together. And I don't know if it can be simplified much more than it is just by the nature of this code evolves with time. Chapters get added, taken away. It's not necessarily in any logical order. So um, those are my thoughts for you on that. Questions or discussion on that? If, I, I have if, a question for, for Paul. So you're talking about each of us looks at the land development code and whatever aligns with our sustainability action plan that we feel needs to be addressed. We just keep a running tab of all those things as we go through the land development code. Is that correct? That's correct. And Thank I think you. you'll see some commonality, hopefully when we emerge out of this okay. discussion that, you know, most of us all said wetlands in some way or another and staff we as staff can work with planning and zoning to make that list into something condensed and understandable and actionable is there a, a time frame or how quickly we're going to be going through this or what are you what are we thinking there i recommend it be in parallel with the framework that um the chair Larson is, is working through with you. You know, we're on a pace here of about one of these frameworks per meeting. Okay. I think we tried to push two in and I don't think we're quite getting that rapid of a feedback yet. So whatever that timeline is, it might be five to six months before we get through all this. But um, I think the important thing is you all have already communicated well with planning and zoning about what your interests are and that you wanna be involved and they know that. And um, this process for them is going to be taking some time to get through. So I think it's all going to work. Yeah, Renee okay. said 18 months at the outset. Um, do you think that it is appropriate to make suggestions of, or go into any spec specificity at this point or just say, these are the areas that I think we should attend to? I'd say uh, recommend as much specificity as you feel you're comfortable with. Um, I do want to manage expectations that this would need to go through a few levels of review. Um, the ideas of this committee recommendations would have to be considered by the staff to be recommended to the city manager. There may be some problems with it, maybe some revisions recommended, and then ultimately the board would need to approve these changes. And um, so I just want to make sure we understand that just because we write something down and submit it here that it's going to happen might not. But I think the main point is you're giving your your recommendations and that's what you're charged to do. Can I get some clarification? So primarily, we're going to be reading through the land development code. 
the entire code in order to no just the opposite i'm trying to save you from that what i'm suggesting is as you're working through these frameworks natural systems for example right. we're getting ready to talk about tonight it has a lot of recommended either actions or objectives right and as you read these things i think it's going to give you ideas and you're going to say you know what i think this should be addressed in the land development code and maybe it already is but you could leave that to staff to look through that and come back with okay we've considered these things you've suggested we look at and here's what we recommend well, that that's perfect actually okay. because i did start reading through some of the relevant areas of the land development code and i was thinking well um how are we going to marry the two you know effectively so it's that makes a lot more sense yes. to be able to look at the um the star rating system under each of the categories and express you know in detail what we really like about particular areas of that and see whether it's already being implemented to some degree yes we don't have to be experts in the land development right I, I think that's asking that. a lot yes mm -hmm. and i'd like to thank paul for coming up with this <laughs> solution well you all for sort of guided us, us actually <laughs> yeah i think he heard what we were saying at the last meeting about just feeling like it's just way too much to try to go through the land development code so this approach kind of helps us get through it in a way that we're already going anyway so if I may add to um, planning and zoning director Renee Vincent, she also her suggestion to us is that we get back to focusing on the sustainability action plan, and she feels that that shaping of that is going to help guide the strategic plan comp plan and land development code as well, so I think it all is heading in that direction. I also want to add, I think there's been some important communication already from this committee to the planning and zoning um, department. You know, the fact that they made that spreadsheet with all the green shading, just the process of doing that forced mm -hmm. that staff to think about how sustainability relates to the land development code. So I think it was a very important step already made before you put your first list together. So, Paul, so they're they're going to be they're going to be going along and implementing things that they feel that we've already requested. And they're, they're doing this action separately from our action of, of, and then seeing where they connect. Is that right? Well, they're already making notes okay. of the changes that they want to suggest um, based on our input and our steering these sustainability items into the picture. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments, Karen or Taylor? To whom do we direct these opinions, uh, items, et cetera? So I think the idea is that once we're done with going through all of the different, um, the framework, then we would go through an activity where we as a group kind of prioritize and and see where we align and so, then so we'll kind of do with the land development code what we're doing with the stark outline that's i think that's the idea and then take those like top ideas and then send them on to either staff or the board commissioners or the city manager i'm not sure who it, it, who it'll go to at this point but we'll work that out as we get closer Yes, I'm picturing for now that you would keep your own list on whether on a computer file or a piece of paper, whatever you're comfortable with. And then when we reach this point, as we get through the last of these seven goal areas, it would be time for us to get together as a group and figure out a consensus um, master list and, and how we do that. You know, we can talk about that in a few months as we get further along. But the key is, as you go now, I would make note of it so that um, you can refer back to it later. We all think we're ready to move on then? Okay. Is this something that we will anticipate having on the agenda at every meeting? Or do we want to postpone it for a month or two? Or 
I think I think the idea is to wait until we've gone through all of the seven uh, goal topic areas. goal areas yeah. in the um, in the framework, and then use that to guide us. Right. Okay. Makes sense. So as we're going as we're going through, and we might be talking about green infrastructure, for instance. Can we put our dreams down, you know, just to the green and in green infrastructure, you know, X, Y, and Z, whatever um, we feel are the highest priorities for that. And you said we can be as detailed or as as um, basic as, as yes. we choose to be. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully the um, they will take that and, and try to align it with the uh, land development code or add to the land development code as needed. Right. Okay. I, I see some discussion from this committee first on the master document. I think it'd be nice to have one document, one memorandum from this group with the total list. And um, that could be communicated as a, as a work product from this committee. Hmm. Okay, any last questions or comments? I, yes, one more question is, are we still ranking so that we know what we're working on? Like what would be a, an agreed priority amongst us? Like we, did, we did the natural systems and we were ranking for outcomes and for actions. And we were trying to at least anticipate what we all feel is a priority. Are we still still going to pursue that so that we know, you know, primarily what we agree that we should be working on? So we're going to do we're going to look at the, the ranking for natural systems tonight and we're going to review that as a group and try to get consensus on priorities for for that. Okay, but then, in addition to that. When we're as you're going through this and you think like green infrastructure is my top thing that the city needs to do i'm going to put five stars by this so that when we as a group later talk about what we want to change the land development code to say or, or the input that we want to give specifically about the land development code then you would just need to say like this is high priority for me so say you've got a list of 20 things and you know that that green infrastructure is your like top thing, then you would just need to make sure that as we're having that conversation at the end of going through all of this, that this really is a sticking point for you. Mm -hmm. Do we anticipate going through the comprehensive plan in addition to the land development code? I don't, I don't know. I have been just because I've been trying to see where it aligns. And what I'm finding is like, for example, like preserving habitat is in the comp plan, <laughs> um, but it may not be spelled out with enough specificity in the land development code that it's maybe having the desired effect. So it may behoove you or each, each of us to look at the comp plan as we're looking through the framework. You know, I'm just going to... Uh throw this thought out here um, because it, it seems to me, I mean, we, were, we, were, we talked a long time ago about the importance of, of the direction of the city having um, sustainability just woven into all aspects of our, you know, our goals for the future, or there might not be a future. So as we're as we're doing this, I, you know, I'm, I'm envisioning and hoping that that's going to be the priority is that is that it is going to be a sustainability plan that drives or sustainability that drives the comprehensive plan and land development. Am I am I um, off in in um, thinking that that is not the goal? I don't think you're off, but I also want to explain, and we're going to get into it um, in one of the other items um, when when I mentioned the uh, presentation to the board of commissioners. But the city is also um, 
going to be doing a um, strategic plan process. So that's where they as a commission and with staff and feedback from the community are going to be looking at the comp plan and then prioritizing that with, with action items attached to it. So my hope is that our sustainability action plan will be feeding into that strategic plan process, strategic planning process, mm -hmm. which will kind of, it'll basically set up a prioritization of the comp plan is my understanding. And correct me, Paul, if I'm off and what I'm, <laughs> my understanding is, but that's, that's kind of my thought is that we're feeding into the, um, the strategic plan, the strategic plan is going to be looking at the comp plan, the land development code, all of the different plans that the city has to kind of create a, a, a list of priorities. I would agree with that. I would also say I think we need to focus on our um, our areas that we're doing in our framework and press on with our SAP and not be too sidetracked with comp plan type things. I think. The idea is to have our plan together so that it can be referred to or utilized in this strategic planning. So we're going to be working on this. That's also going to be happening in parallel. I don't think we want to wait to do anything for anything to be fleshed out. Uh, keep in mind, there's still a lot of discussion that needs to happen on strategic planning by the public, mm -hmm. uh, the commission. So where that is going to end up, I don't think anyone can really predict right now. So I think that the good advice I got from the planning director was you all should really focus on your sustainability action plan, and get that out there as early as possible so that that all can be considered in these other plans. And keep in mind, it's not our only chance ever to be in right. the comp plan or the um, land development code or strategic plan. These are living documents. So I think that that's the, the direction that I got out of this is that we really need to get back to this sustainability action plan. And that, that is what we're working on, by the way, when we're doing these natural systems, climate and energy, this is really all the sustainability action plan. I, I want to make sure people understand that. Mm -hmm. This is actually gonna work its way into chapter five of our plan as we've outlined it. All those focus areas, what are we gonna focus on? It's gonna come right out of these frameworks. I'm, I'm a little concerned about the direction in which I hear us heading right now. I mean, I came tonight prepared to discuss the green areas in the land development code and to discuss natural systems and um, the uh, climate and energy portions of, of the star code. I thought that that was what we were charged with. And after hearing Renee Vincent's presentation to us, I clearly thought we were being asked to be partners in in writing uh, some revisions to the land development code as a first step. Now it sounds as though we're being told to stay in our lane. Uh, and you know we can maybe have something to do with the land development code later. Or maybe a strategic plan which that's this is new information to me and I wonder what has happened, because to me, this sounds like. Uh -uh, no, we really didn't mean it. We want you to do this. I, I, th I work best. This is just me. I work best if I'm comparing things against each other. Uh, that's just the way I, I, I operate. So I think that the feedback that the group gave last month was that it was too overwhelming to be looking. I can't hear you, Dory. I think that the, the feedback that our group collectively gave city staff last month was that going through that all of those tabs and looking at all of that green that was outlined in land development code was too much and that we would prefer to give feedback as we are, like we collectively keep our feedback as we're going through each like natural systems and climate and energy and then be able to give them something instead of us trying to go through each of the different components on our own, that that was just too complicated. The land development code and then the language in the land develop development code is so much more specific than anything in the star system that I, I really think we will benefit by being repeatedly immersed in the land development code as we go along. 
I like the specificity of the wording. I really do. I think if we are knowledgeable about the wording in the land development code and how planning and zoning wants to modify it going forward, it will help us create a better sustainability plan. I see it as complementary. Then I, don't I see one coming and then the other coming later. May I make a comment? Sure. Karen, um, Paul, I, uh, I agree with you on that. Um, I do see how they go hand in hand and I appreciate um, that we are looking at, at these. Um, I did kind of re refocus and think to myself, wow, we, our, our charge was really to write a sustainability action plan. And, um, and so I, I, I do think we need to make sure that that becomes our focus. And the fact that Paul Smith mentions that all those documents, whether it's the land development code or the comprehensive plan, strategic planning, et cetera, it's all living and working um, documents. So I think that it can only help us to be knowledgeable about the areas of the land development code, but I don't think we're in a position to write or re recommend rather um, things at this point. So going back to the very first item on this agenda in kind of keeping your running list on items from the land development code that are important, I think can only help us to write that sustainability action plan. So they are going hand in hand, but I really do, um, I, you know, I really do think one of our biggest charges going when we first started this was to write a sustainability action plan. And the sooner we can kind of have that focus, I feel like then we can also add in those meat and potatoes as we're looking at the land development code. And, you know, so I, I kind of appreciate the way that this is going. I read that land development code and thought, wow, um, I am in way over my head on this because I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing with it. So I appreciate having that as a resource as I'm going through these things. But I do think we really, I, I, I would agree, personal opinion that the sustainability action plan is kind of, I feel like is, is, our, is our task. It started out as our um, our charge, and as Paul has said in the past, our charge has led to other things developing as we go along, and and some enthusiasm for certain areas and members of the staff. Um, your comments could be interpreted in in both directions, Karen, if you realize that. You you basically agreed with both sides. Well, I do. I think that it's important. I think it's important that we use the 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 language or the um, the codes that are already there, or looking, you know, just keeping that running list. Um, I think it's important because I think it does run parallel with what we're trying to do, writing this sustainability action plan. But if we get so far away from actually trying to write the sustainability action plan, it's, it's gonna be five years before that comes out. You know, I feel like we've, we, we have to be very careful not to go down too many of the rabbit holes that are pulling us away from one of our main tasks. So as I was reading the plan, it, I, I found some spots that like I could, Probably, or I've thought of a few recommendations and things like that. We can almost use it as kind of like a baseline of where we're at. And then we're, as we're going through the star system, you know, these are things that where we can improve and like saying things we can improve on. But, um, you know, just I've seen a few things and obviously I'm not like an engineer or lawyer or anything like that, but um, I have spotted a few things that I would like to see change. So I don't know, maybe it can kind of just be like a hand in hand thing where we're getting like the the verbiage and how it's phrased and where we are at right now and then kind of pair that with the plan and what we want to see change so to to kind of move us move us forward i think that we my, my preference is to focus on the sustainability action plan, be cognizant of the fact that there are other documents like the land development code and the comp plan, and each make that running list of priorities 
and then be as specific as you'd like. So if you would like to be really prescriptive about what your recommendation is, then make sure that you're doing that. And if you would just like to make a general, I think that wetlands need to be preserved, then I think that that's fair as well. I think that we just need to be moving forward with the sustainability action plan and you know, using what, the tools that we have to help um, as we are feeding into those land development code and then other, you know, plans as well as we're being um, asked to participate. So I would like us to go ahead and wrap this item up unless and move on to the, the conversation about natural systems. Okay, so I'd make a comment. Okay, I think just for the um, psychology of the committee, it would be good to get some things done, you know, and do little bits at a time, get it done. And, and I agree that the land development code is really um, a, a helpful thing to read, but it does seem as though we're like going this way rather than um, focusing and getting a plan written. And then once we have certain things written, one can expand upon them. At least when I work, that seems to help to have smaller goals and feel like I've accomplished something and then move on um, instead of adding tasks and not feeling like we've gotten anywhere. Thank you. Okay, so in that spirit, moving on to item number three, natural systems and climate and energy, uh, I would like to be able to get our priorities set so that we can hand it off to Paul Smith so that he can start compiling that and actually writing that first section of the sustainability action plan based on what we've got. So I'm going to share my screen so that we're all looking at the same thing. Um, Dory, if I may just say one thing about the natural systems, sure. I just wanted to let you guys know that from what you sent me, if you did put a maybe by one of the um, local actions or outcomes, I did add that as a vote, but if it required clarification, I did not add that. So if you guys had any questions about the ones that you uh, mentioned you needed clarification. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you everybody. Can, are you guys why is it not sharing my screen? I can see it. Yeah, I see it on my computer. Okay. I see it. Folks at home. Yeah, I can see it now. I'm on a bit of a delay though.
Hello, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we're running a technical issue on the Zoom call, so I'll be with you in just one moment. So anyone right, who is I'm on Zoom cannot hear anyone in the auditorium at this point. Okay. I think my headset might have cut out as well, though. Or, well, I can hear you. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. On Zoom, not in the other room. Sorry. I'm sorry.
And I think looking at it in terms of phases um, allows things to be a little more doable and cost effective. I think that that's an excellent point. <laughs> um, and also what I noticed on St. Pete's plan is there's a time frame. So some of we're good. Okay, thank you. So some of the items are, you know, short term goals, and some of them are longer term goals, and then there's some that are um, intermediate. So um, I think that that's something to consider. And then also, I just want to really reiterate two things. Um, we don't have to write the plan <laughs> where it's that, like if if one of the things is to create a well, for example. Right here, action number two, create a community-wide green infrastructure plan that's integrated with other relevant local plans. I don't see that as our responsibility to create the, the plan. I see that as a recommendation that the city takes up and then city staff starts to work on the plan. Mm -hmm. And then as we're going on, we could, you know, once we have the plan written, then when we move on to our next phase of work, it may be feeding into if we decide to select a green infrastructure plan, you know, and giving input into that. But I don't think that we have to have all of the answers tonight for what that's gonna look like. It's just, we would like for that to be an item in the plan. That, and then I also, before we get any further, um, we did not get enough feedback from enough members to have a conversation tonight about climate and, um, uh, was it energy and climate? So, um, so we're just going to have this conversation about natural systems tonight, mm -hmm. um, because you know I don't think it would be right to only have two or three of us having an opinion going forward with with the rest of it. So, um, so that's just another limiter of our you know ability to get the plan written as quickly as we can. Is everybody each month being able to? Um, give feedback to you know for each of the items so i i will kind of give some food for thought um about um the climate and energy piece um at the end but just for it's, it's 6 45 right now so i'm just trying to make sure that we're using our time wisely tonight and just you know setting expectations so um so let's start going through natural systems um I'm going to minimize that. Okay. So everybody can see the results and you guys all had the results um, that were provided as part of the backup for tonight. So thank you to Ashley for getting all of that work compiled. Um, I printed it. And like I said, I kind of just, I just took the items that had seven votes and put that at the top and made a running list. So um, what I propose is that we just go through each of them first, or just go through the list first, and then kind of circle back and see what we might want to focus on for actually adding into the plan. And then also keep in mind that this is going to then require some community feedback as well. You know, this, these are like what our committee is recommending, but then we'll want feedback from the community, want feedback from, you know, with the bang the table, and, and we'll talk about how to get that feedback as well. So the, the highest, um, with seven votes for outcomes is um, natural systems two, which is biodiversity and invasive species. And so the, community level outcomes for natural systems number two is um, habitat conservation and connectivity. So achieve no net loss of habitat areas for threatened species or increase the connectivity between habitats needed for threatened species. All seven of us said that that is one of the outcomes, that, the, the outcome that we would like to prioritize most. Then the next item is natural systems one, which is looking at green infrastructure. Um, outcome number one, green stormwater infrastructure. And I think that 
probably that's because a lot of us are concerned with the flooding. Mm -hmm. So um, option A is demonstrate 35% of the jurisdiction's land areas designated green stormwater infrastructure, providing bioretention and infiltration services, or B, demonstrate no more than 65% of the jurisdiction's land area contains impervious surfaces. So I think we need to have a conversation about A or B. Um, if, if I'm reading that correctly, that we would want to focus on one or the other, or thoughts about that? Or both. It's interesting that St. Pete, in, in their ISAP, chose outcome number two uh, uh, rather than outcome number one. But if you think about the density of the population in a city the size of St. Pete, that makes more sense. Whereas with our city, I think outcome number one makes more sense for us. Yeah. But I don't know that we need to to decide option A versus option B. Do you? I wanted to get some other people's opinions besides mine. Mm -hmm. Well, if you think about these as endpoints and you're saying this is the endpoint I want to have, I think you need to be specific about which one. Um, the first one has to do with how much ability do you have to absorb the stormwater. B has to do with how much stormwater are you creating. That's that's the difference between the two. My preference is, is option A, if nobody else is really going to weigh in, but. That's mine too, okay. if we have to pick one or the other. Yeah, okay, so I'm going to denote that. The next item is natural um, systems number three. And uh, there is a- Could you um, say why you prefer A over B? Um, I, to me, because I don't think that we're anywhere near, like some cities are very heavily built out and have a whole lot of impervious surfaces. Mm -hmm. I don't think that our city is anywhere near that. That, that's my personal, that's why. Um, and do you think we meet um, option A? This is this demonstrate that for if we. Yes. I see that I suspect we don't have that, but I don't know. It would be nice to know. And if we find that we are already, we have 35%, then we can always increase the number as well. I mean, to me, it's, it's a flex goal. You know what I mean? Because some of these we're going to get there and then we're going to want to continue to improve, not just go, okay, we're good. We don't need to worry about it. Yeah, Dory. So, how much it says demonstrate that 35% of the jurisdiction's land area has designated green stormwater infrastructure, et cetera. Do we know how much we have? Do we have any? I mean, I don't know what we're, what we're talking about here. Right. Is that, so, is that I mean, 35% sounds good. I know the city's doing all kinds of improvements in the in the water system right now and i don't know how that figures in or even what what they're doing now with the big pipes how that's gonna dovetail with this yeah i mean i think we would need to capture some baseline data for that like we did when we were asking how much of the city is open space yeah and why does 35 percent doesn't seem a lot. Why is that a good goal, 35% as opposed to 80% or something like that? Well, I just think of all the homes that don't have really any green stormwater infrastructure, like they don't have any rain barrels, they don't have any mm. of the things that, so I, I think that that's where that number would be helpful. But, are, but is this about private homes as well or just city property land area or all, all the land area 
some of them are specific to government property. And then some of them are like, if it says jurisdictions land area to me, that's citywide. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the same thing as far as the baseline with option B. I don't know if we have any uh, non, I mean, I guess we have some parking lots and things like the gravel parking lot that are per, not impervious surfaces. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how, would, how we could find that information. In other words, if you decide to not concrete your driveway or and do something else instead i mean how is that all tallied and yeah that would be a gis type of formula there we could utilize i think county has some gis resources that we could tap into they have the whole county uh, and it's it's really a calculation of how much you know roads concrete building areas all of these things that um, don't absorb stormwater so um, the reason I would hesitate to make the option B the goal is that now you're talking about changing existing development roads infrastructure to possibly reduce that number. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be very difficult to do, whereas option A more focuses on that sort of proactive uh, when we develop we're going to add to this tally of green infrastructure to approach that 35%. As far as the number itself, I'd like to remind everybody this framework was based on um, uh, four years of work with uh, I think 50 different local governments that implemented it. And there was a whole team of people that worked on these numbers. So I think these aren't arbitrary, these percentages. I think these are based on achievable standards for uh, cities across the country. So um, they're really benchmarks I don't know if we have the expertise here to um, change those numbers, at least on our first attempt. I think we just should look at these as, okay, um, I like that type of metric. Let's utilize the recommended number for now. That's gonna drive us towards starting to do these baselines and see where we stand. Mm -hmm. That step itself is very important. And then as we gain more knowledge and with time, we can adjust these, um, numbers to match what would best meet our needs. So good. That's an excellent point that these numbers have already been vetted and that's a baseline number that over a broad, broad area. Would brick streets be considered since they are pervious, mm -hmm. would they be considered green infrastructure? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're as green as, as pervious asphalt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. We may be well below 65 percent yeah. in Tarpon Springs. And if they do some more rebricking, taking up asphalt and rebricking the streets, that would contribute to that too. Mm -hmm. Well, let's look into that. Because I, one of the things that um, comes to mind as we're reading all of the material is we can have an a influence uh, or in the decisions that the city makes on for city property, but um, until we get the public engaged, uh, we're not going to be. I love the ecological literacy. Um, we can, we can't really tell people what they can do with their own property. I mean, we can start to educate. You know the the reasons um, and the value of in making particular improvements. But the only thing I think initially that there's any control or influence over is um, what the city owns and what the city um, cares for. I think that's a good point, Denise. Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of um, waiting to think about, you know, how how we can present and and invite people to participate in the vision that we have for the city because I think a lot of people will really will really um, grasp it and um, embrace it but um, there that's a lot inviting them to do that is a whole lot better than than uh, mandating mm -hmm. uh, business is 
my you know is a big concern i th because i think that they have a lot of influence in the city and a lot of uh, manufacture a lot of waste and um, the biggest parking lots are probably business parking lots so that is um that's it's still private and um yet that's um, those are partners that I really hope that we can get as champions in, in this vision that we have mm -hmm. down the road. But um, at this point, I think all we're going to be able to think about is what we will actually be able to make recommendations on that or we have some control over through um, the city rewriting the code. Or, or modifying the code and uh, working on the grand vision within properties that are actually influenced by the government here. Mm -hmm. sure. It's interesting that quite action items six and seven, uh, you know, and kind of speak to what you just said, Denise, and yet they were at the bottom of the list in terms of what the committee voted in, uh, to include. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that also speaks to what Dory was talking about is that a concurrent education plan and creating a culture in the city to where this is what Tarpon Springs is known for being this type of a city like Denise you're from Portland. Seattle, Seattle and you know Seattle and Portland are known that the culture that's of those cities are very strong and people know what's what's how they're expected to contribute and participate and so forth i think we're in the very very early stages of that mm -hmm. so i think your your idea to invite people to participate as we create a, you know systems that everyone can have a sense of pride in of how they're contributing to the well-being of the city and our you know the greening of our city and that type of thing but i think that's those are more long-term goals as well you know i mean that's hard to change a culture I do think, though, if um, so, for example, if the city took on the policy of if they built a parking lot or something, they use that material that water seeps through. Mm -hmm. And if they could then um, have it so that they could make that material available to businesses mm -hmm. and private people at a good cost then um you know if they bought lots of it in bulk and the people could buy it then from the city and it would be cost effective for them to put that in rather than to put the other things in and then they meet the environmental goal so those sort of private public things you know projects um can work here and um so that's a way of approaching it. So um, it's a project that um, just has a, has the incentives built in, but um, can reach people cost effectively. Again, I think that that cost effective things are very, very important. So if we can make things affordable for people and they're and they're good for the environment and the city, then it's a win win situation. Okay, I'm going to move us on to the next item, which is natural systems three, which is natural resource protection. Uh, two and three both received six votes. So outcome two is achieve no net loss of wetland streams and shoreline buffers. And three is increase the amount of natural or restored areas directly connected to regional natural systems in order to, prove, to improve ecosystem services. I'm just going to keep going through these um, natural systems five is water in the environment and um, that received five votes uh, outcome number one so watershed health index demonstrate a local watershed health index greater or, or equal <clears throat> to 70 or demonstrate that the water withdrawn from the system for human use does not exceed the amount of fresh water entering the system through precipitation river flow and other sources mm -hmm. um so just 
for item number one, there's a option A or B, and I'm not sure that we have uh, a need for like the watershed health to be really scrutinized. I think that the city is is doing that with our wells, um, but I would like to ensure that the water that we're pumping out <laughs> is not greater than what's being replenished, so that we're staying sustainable with with future water needs. So my my preference would be option B on that. Discussion? Thoughts? Might as well. I mean, we're a local watershed. We're part of a big water, Tampa Bay watershed system. But I think option B, I, I would agree with you, Dory. Mm -hmm. Okay. The next item with five votes is natural systems three. So going back to uh, natural resource protection. So obviously that's weighing on us. Um, goal outcome number four is restoration. So that, like I said, received five votes as well. So there's two options there. Reduce the difference between the actual acreage restored and targeted acreage established in the natural systems plan or land conservation plan, or B, restore degraded natural resource areas at a ratio greater than 1% of developed land area in the jurisdiction. Thoughts about that? Preference for option A or B? I can't answer the question without having more information. Okay. I don't know where we are in terms of these numbers in this city. So why don't we put a pin in that and ask staff to kind of get some data points for us that would help with that? Mm -hmm. And what would that mean in real time, uh, a ratio greater than 1% of developed land area? What is that equal to of our total land area? It's like, it's hard for me to know the scope that what we're talking about, but I know that the, the numbers have been vetted and this is what people say, but it would be helpful for me to know what that means in Tarpon Springs. Right. Paul Smith, is that request? Yeah, I made note of that. I okay. don't have that number handy, but yeah. Okay, it's outcome, it's natural systems three, outcome number four, restoration. So I'll make a note of that. It does seem that we need an inventory or baseline on, on a bit of this yeah um, really specific data with percentages i mean we we have no clue where we're at mm -hmm. and then moving on with four votes natural systems one so we're going back to green infrastructure mm -hmm. Um, outcome number two, demonstrate 85% of the population lives within a third mile distance from green infrastructure features that provide localized cooling through a tree canopy or vegetative surfaces. So next one is natural systems three. So I'm scrolling back down to natural resource protection. Outcome number three is connectivity. So that received four votes as well. So increase the amount of natural or restored areas directly connected to regional natural systems in order to improve ecological service or ecosystem services. And then the last item that received four votes is natural systems four. So um, I'm not sure everybody's thoughts on this. Um, Outdoor air quality, uh, looking at that entire um, objective area, only received four votes, um, as well as working lands, only received, I think, two votes. Um, my inclination, I mean, I, I don't know that Tarpon has, I've, I mean, from, I have, some cursory understanding, and I don't think that we have particularly bad air quality compared to the rest of the country or compared to the rest of the region. 
Um, so my my preference would be to um, not include a uh, a goal for outdoor air quality or for working lands. I wanted to throw that out there and see what you guys thought of that. Um, working lands was your second one. Yeah, working lands only received two votes. I, I don't know the answer to your question uh, regarding the quality of the air in Tarpon Springs. I would love to see that. Mm -hmm. I will tell you from the perspective of public health that outdoor air quality is the greatest concern right now among a majority of specialists in medicine because that is the area that we see the greatest impact from climate change on human health right now. So I don't know that I wanna just throw this one away until we have some information from staff about the quality of air in Turpin Springs. Mm -hmm. It may be fantastic, but I, I don't have any numbers. Are they talking about like when you, when you read the air quality index that talks, you know, air quality today is this, that, or the other, is that what they're talking about here, Paul? Yes. We also know that air quality varies in different parts of the city. So, and we know that in oftentimes in low income areas where there's manufacturing or anything like that, the air quality is worse. We know that that population also ha often has higher asthma and things like that. So one would have to look at the city, you know, different parts of the city to address this issue of air quality. And I agree with you that that is a major issue in climate change, that the quality is bad. And we know that if the quality could be improved, um, things like asthma would um, go away, or at least be minimized. So I think it'd be good to find out those, those um, statistics. So let's um, put a pin in this one as well, ask staff if they could do some research on uh, where we are with, um, for outcome number one, it's concentration and emissions of criteria air pollutants. So mm -hmm. it's real specific NOx um, and uh, sulfur dioxide levels, uh, particulate uh, of certain sizes. So it's, 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 it's not just, air quality, it's looking at specific, these criteria air pollutants um, and see if we're in attainment. I, I would suspect we are based on the, the knowledge that I have looking at huh. that kind of data with, uh, with DEP in the state. Mm -hmm. And then if we are, then, I mean, if we're already achieving attainment, then I don't know that we need to really focus on it. Well, well, we've got lots about? of other fish to fry. <laughs> But wouldn't um, people who live or businesses that are near um, 19 um, have less air quality than, let's say, myself who lives in a bayou? I mean, my air quality is probably a lot better than that. So how do you make those generalizations? Well, I don't know that they have data at the, the level of granularity that you're mm. wanting specificity for. Like, I don't even know if that data is being collected by any agency. So, and I also, my understanding of just the geography is that we're not, we don't have a valley where mm. that air is being held in a bowl mm -hmm. that as the sea breeze blows, even along 19, which I suspect you're correct, that those levels are higher along 19. I don't think that they're concentrated and staying there the way that they are like in LA because they're physically being held there by the environment. I think it's all just kind of blowing off. Um, uh, I was going to say, I, you know, I lived in LA in the seventies and you could literally see smog floating down the street. Oh, That's man. how bad it was. Flying up out of uh, LAX in the seventies. It was horrible. You could see when the, the sky was brown. <laughs> and so there were, there was definite motivation to change that. I think that when you live in such a small, area where there is not a lot of industry um, that causes pollution it's a different different um, perspective altogether but it would be nice just to get the baseline mm -hmm. um, on what 
our air quality is like. And if it's something that we can brag about, that's great, right? Because <laughs> I'm sure you you know the uh, the the uh, fire department runs a local weather stem site and they publish all kinds of data every day. But whether they break it down by different regions in the city, I have no no clue. Yeah, I did some preliminary looking online. There's some information available from the county. The county has an air quality division, so I can do a little more looking there. I do remember my preliminary look was I didn't see anything alarming. Um, however, I think this is a good idea. I'll go back and look at how the numbers compare to these attainment goals. And uh, I'll see if I can report back to you on that. I think that's a great suggestion. Mm -hmm. that, that way you get a sense of it without having to be an expert. All right, so then the next item only received three votes, which is not a majority. So I would like to not include that as well. It's working lands. Uh, you no, it's it's we didn't have any priorities in uh, working lands because only two people. Didn't we say something about changing that to water? Yes. Or rephrasing it because that's where the um, work happens here. And based on that, there are still two. Okay. So I don't, you know, I don't think we need to really address that. Mm -hmm. um, so then that would leave us with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, if we include the, um, the outdoor air quality or seven without, which I think is a great start. We've got some outcomes that we've agreed upon. <laughs> um, so now the, the local actions are kind of how to implement the outcomes or how to get what are the, the nitty gritty steps to get to those outcomes. Mm -hmm. So this is where it's going to be a little tricky because um, when you look, I think I'm going to go through it this way, uh, starting with natural systems one, just because they're together and we'll go through one, two, three, four, five. Um, but like I said, there are 20, I think I added up um, local actions. And I think we need to get that down closer to 10, mm -hmm. um, realistically. Yeah. So um, the first one, natural systems one, let me go back up so that we're all on the same page. Oops, not too far. Um, green infrastructure. There are, um, nine actions that could be taken and um, the ones with the highest votes are action one which is assess the state of the jurisdiction's urban forest uh, action two create a community-wide green infrastructure plan that is integrated with other relevant local plans and item number or action number four which is include evaluation of green infrastructure potential during early site reviews of proposed developments and subdivisions. All three of those got seven votes. Mm -hmm. So I think that we should prioritize those three items. Um, the next four natural systems, one green infrastructure, receiving six votes were items number three, action item three and action item eight. So action item three is adopt local design criteria and associated codes that require proactive green infrastructure practices for new developments. Hmm. So uh, that goes to, uh, I think Denise, what you're saying, wanting to have like impervious uh, roadways or parking mm -hmm. lots, all of those kind of things. And like I said, it's not for us to necessarily have to identify what those what the wording of those codes would be, but certainly if that's a, you know, and it is, uh, six of us agreed to that this is a priority, maybe start to plan some feedback of what you'd like mm -hmm. in the land development code, mm -hmm. how you would want to improve that so that we would have uh, more, you know, it would help meet the goal, which is having that 35% right. being, uh, having green infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that all five of those should remain for now. And then let's go on to natural systems. Excuse me, yep. what, was, what was action item number eight? Oh, I'm sorry. 
Uh, action item number eight is dedicate a percentage of funding invested in green infrastructure. Huh. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think we should be flexible and realize that things might change during the time that we discuss these things. Um, if you look at action six, it's exactly what Carol was talking about, creating incentives um, to encourage landowners to ad adopt green infrastructure practices. She was, I mean, that's exactly what she said. That came in dead last, but in light of what she just suggested, I would put it more near the top of the list now. Okay, so I think that you're right that as we start talking through this, we should leave ourselves some flexibility to mm -hmm. insert items or maybe take items out after further review. Um, so I just made note of that. So that's natural systems one, a the action item number six. Okay. But you know, the thing you're saying about action five, that's a way of accomplishing you know, the thing about the goal. So, I mean, they, they can be combined in ways that um, aren't separate actions, but they're complementary actions. I agree. It's, we're able to do that, we should. Yeah. In the language. I'm making a note of that as well. Okay. So for natural systems two, um, receiving seven votes is one, two, and nine. So action one under NS2 is biodiversity and invasive species. Action plan or action, uh, local action one is to create a plan for management of local species that minimizes damage from invasive species and enhances biodiversity and ecosystem services. So this is what I was talking about where that's, that's a big undertaking to, um, to create a plan of management for local species. Um, also item number two is received seven votes, and that is under policy and code adjustment, adopt or enforce an ordinance requiring control of listed priority invasive species, mm -hmm. or an act of preferred plant ordinance for private and public landscaping. My understanding is that we actually already have that. <laughs> so I don't know that, that uh, I, I, that's part of the land development code update is that they are reviewing the plants that are on the invasive list and also reviewing plants that we want to include on the um, preferred plant list. So, um, and that's what the Arbor, that's what Shannon weighs in on and, and is, has really good working knowledge of collaborating with them. So. Right. So I think that we should definitely keep two in there. And I just mentioned that as like, I don't know that that would be a huge heavy lift because yeah. the city's already kind of looking at that. So are you suggesting that we, kind of sidebar it for right now since it's already in the works rather than put it as, as one of our items? Well, I'd like to keep it in just so that they understand that it's a priority. It's a priority. Thank you, yeah. It would also be good not only to have a preferred plant, but a, a list of what not to have. Like, you know, in the north of here, like in Georgia, don't plant kudzu. <laughs> yeah, that's, I think that that would go in the invasive species yeah. list that they're creating. That's the first okay. Yeah. Um, and then no, action, uh, you're, you're right. It lo would. Local action nine is um, facility and infrastructure improvements. Ensure that all local government owned buildings use native and or sustainable and site appropriate species in landscaping. Mm -hmm. So that's something like going back to what the city can control mm -hmm. and not have to have, you know, that's not a heavy lift either because the yeah. city can manage that. Um, my own, so like where I'm at with this is, is number one 
I, I, I'm thinking that that may be, uh, well, I guess I'll just put a pin in it and just, because as we're looking through creating a plan, this is one of the ones that we're asking for four plans to be created here with this, mm -hmm. just in this one item or in this one natural systems. Um, so I would like to so maybe reconsider keeping that, what, that one on. One thing, like the last thing you read, action, what was it, nine? Uh-huh. You know, using Florida plants, right? Native, Native and or sustainable. sustainable. Uh-huh. The thing is, is that the way this is written, it's like, it's that it makes it sound like it's discrete. Well, one of the things about using native plants is it saves water, right? right? You don't really have to irrigate, right? And somehow it would be really good to have a plan that sort of shows the relationship between it, that there's a network, an ecosystem or whatever, instead of this or they're just discrete items. So, um, so here's this one hooks to this one. and. To address that, um, what the city of St. Pete did in their um, sustainability action plan is they have, oh no, come on now, cooperate. <laughs> oh, of course, it's not going to put me right back on the page that I was on, but um, here, let me just get to the first, it's got a crosswalk. <sighs> Strategy co-benefits. Mm -hmm. So that's where you would indicate that it's, you know, you would put the, um, the water okay, got it. next to that so that they understand that it's not just in a side. Like it's a matrix yep. rather than discrete. And yep. I think that's really important because when you read these things, it's, it doesn't make much sense. We have to show how everything's connected and um, why one thing leads to another, one thing's important to the other. Yep, completely okay. agree. Perfect. Okay, um, so moving on to natural systems three, natural resource protection, local actions uh, that received seven votes were items one, two, and five. So item one is plan development. Again, develop a plan to protect and restore natural resources through land conservation, corridor connectivity, and restoration of biological integrity and function. That's another big plan that we would be asking for. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Um, item number two that received seven votes is action, uh, action two, policy and code enforcement, adopt land use regulations that establish appropriate wetland stream and shoreline buffer widths and adjacent land uses. Mm -hmm. So again, we have that in the land development code. I would like to see those buffers getting bigger mm -hmm. um and i and obviously we all do because we got and some votes we, i mean in the land development code it said it was 30 feet i remember paul said increasing it like to 50 feet how do we know what's the optimal um amount i mean i guess that's not our job to figure that out but Oh, right, and that's reading. part of um, I, that I sent around that one document that's from um, EPA. It's like a federal guidelines for planners, mm -hmm. and it has and it has some outline guidelines. And then I also looked at Alachua County. I think I shared that resource as well, um, and they've just got much wider buffers. So I think that we should, you know, we should be setting model policy for. I mean. We live on a bayou system. We're flooding. <laughs> Do we have daytime flooding? I don't think that that, I mean, to me, like we've got all of the reasons why we should be doing that. Mm -hmm. So we should be seeking as aggressive as we can, in my opinion. Okay, and then um, item number five, education and outreach. Sponsor activities to increase ecological literacy and knowledge about natural resource protection. So that's what I was referring to. So there's that, and then we have it in natural systems five for the water quality. Uh, so I think we could lump those together and just say increase ecological literacy and list all of the different items that we want to create uh, 
an educational plan around. Okay, um, the next item is natural systems three, still staying with natural systems three. Um, these received six votes each and they're item seven and eight. So action item seven is enforcement and incentives, implement local and market-based financing strategies to acquire land or development easements or fund restoration and maintenance activities. And then item action item eight is facility and infrastructure improvements, restore, maintain, and monitor conserved natural lands to increase natural resource resilience, ad adaptability, and biological integrity. I'm sorry, where are we right now? Natural systems three. Okay. Um, items number, action item seven and eight, each received six votes. It's on page 128, 127 yeah, and 128. It. Yeah, it. If we stop there, there's 13 local actions already. Mm -hmm. Um. Moving I have, on. I move. have a question. Uh huh. So, this is back to the one about having a buffer with wetlands. And so, I guess my question is how does this relate to development? So, um, a city is going to want there to be development, I take it. Um, and but if you have and that if you have buffers that are so big that they prevent development. So I'm thinking of, you know, certain developments on private land where um, you know someone owns a piece of land and they want to develop it, but they can't now because there's all these buffers. Um, so how I guess I want to know how these these things that we're suggesting which I think are wonderful, inter, interact with issues of development and you know, economic development. So where is it our job to think about that? Or is it our job just to put forth what our, uh, we think should be the best practices in terms of sustainability? I mean, I think it's, it's all connected because part of sustainability is that economic viability of the city as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I guess my way of thinking is we can just propose what we feel comfortable with and they can do with it. These are just recommendations. It's not like we're approving anything anyway, <laughs> you know? Well, and that already exists with, you know, utility easements and setbacks. And I mean, you know, the, it, that already is, in there to some degree already. And in other words, if you want to develop all of your property, but you have a utility easement of 40 feet, you just can't do it. It's not like, well, that's my right to do it. It's what the, the code of the city says you can and can't do. So that's that's where, you know, this, I don't know how much pushback there would be um, or not, mm -hmm. um, but, I don't know. I guess we have to wait and see, see what we suggest and how Well, this how is part out. of that balancing act that I was talking about earlier is that as this committee makes recommendations, it would first go through a staff review and then ultimately a review by the board of commissioners. And there would be in this example, it's a good example, Dr. Mickett, um, if we made a sweeping recommendation to, let's say, double the buffer around wetlands, suddenly certain people's properties that they could develop on can't now, they're probably going to speak up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's going to be that balancing act. And that all has to be considered. I would recommend that this group come through with the most reasonable, defensible recommendations that you can. And if you don't feel comfortable getting into that detail, that's what I said before, you just say, I'd like the, the wetland buffers to be revisited in the land development code and, and leave it at that. So, um, but yes, I think there is gonna be a balancing act between property rights and protecting the environment. There always has been, there always will be. And I think the right answer will be a balance that works for everyone. 
And there might be varying degrees as well for um, setting standards for new development versus grand grandfathering mm. old ways mm -hmm. for properties that exist. I mean, historical properties, let's say, it's not going to make a lot of um, changes for the properties mm -hmm. as much as let's let's look at what can be changed. Anything that's being developed now, being built now need you know definitely take into consideration the optimal um path mm -hmm. but there's got to be some forgiveness um on historical properties and um things that have been here for a long time that have functioned okay yes they may have times of the year where there's that lack of buffer is going to affect them greatly, but you know it might not be something that's within our control. We can only make recommendations for new development, I think, mm -hmm. and and then invite people to participate in as much as they can to protect property through their what they do on their own land. Right. Well, there's that there's that space too. It's like with Swift Mud saying, "Okay, you can't dig wells anymore. We, we can't have everybody digging their own wells." Mm -hmm. But the, the wells that were grant that had already been in place at some of the historical properties, they can still use those for irrigation. Mm -hmm. So that's that that balancing act. But someone who comes in, no, our water table can't sustain this. We can't have every person, a homeowner, dig their own well. It's not going to work. So as as mm -hmm. part of you know where we're trying to land is somewhere that makes sense for the long term future too, as we know that sea level is rising and you know we're going to we're, we're kind of looking down the road mm -hmm. and seeing what what's you know signs might be ahead and, and trying to at least provide cautionary guidance to that and input at some point it might be just the way it is I mean people might say yes, uh, you know, so I've had this property I'd wanted to do X, Y and Z with it for 30 years. But guess what? You can't because the water's up too high now. You know, I mean, it's going to get to that point. Right. But we're we're I mean, we're in the early phases of that. But at some point, it will be. This will all be mandated because of how the world is going to be looking. You know, mm -hmm. but we're not there yet. Yeah. To give you a very personal example, um, I built a trellis. Uh, be you know, at the edge of my property between mine and my next door neighbors and tried to get some vines to grow. Um, they used various kinds of native uh, Florida uh, vines to grow on my trellis and everything died. Uh, even though I used uh, people from Wilcox who, who know, who should know, you know, what's gonna survive. And come to find out my neighbor has had salt intrusion into the well that is on his property that he uses for irrigation that's been there for decades. His grandfather in law mm -hmm. uh, dug the well. He's got salt intrusion into the well. He's killing his plants and killing <laughs> my vines. <laughs> and he recognized it and he's now watering by hand. But even though this huh. well has been there for a long time, you know, from time to time, we're going to have salt intrusion, particularly in the dry season mm -hmm. in Florida. But as sea level rise increases, mm -hmm. this kind of little anecdote is going to occur more frequently. Right. It's just not going to be able to be a reality in some, at some mm -hmm. point. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good, uh, good observation, Paul. So we're at 737 and <laughs> like to try to get through natural systems tonight. <laughs> okay, we're ready. And get through the presentation. <laughs> okay. So move us along, there, okay. Chair Woman. Um, natural system, the next item. So, like I said, some of these are six and some of them are seven because I'm just going through an order this, this time. Um, natural systems four is the outdoor air quality. And the only action item in this that received six or seven votes is action item number five which is enforce anti-idling regulations or burning restrictions. Mm -hmm. We don't have that in the city anyway. Like I, you aren't allowed to burn trash in the city. So mm -hmm. I don't think that we need to include this one. Um, My neighbors burn things. Really? Yeah. Um, okay, well then. Uh, <laughs> no, they don't burn trash, but they burn like. Fire pit? No, they, well, they, some do that, but they burn, you know stuff they cut sometimes i mean 
I'll add something here. The county is the one that enforces the air regulations. They're the ones with the air program. So I don't know how that'll factor into your discussion, but it isn't necessarily something we could um, control locally. I mean, the anti-idling we can, but I think the city already has an anti-idling policy in place for mm -hmm. staff vehicles yes. while they're... So, I mean, maybe some education around that, but my inclination would be to, to not include this item. I'm just gonna throw that out there. And also putting a pin in the fact that we were gonna go back and look and see if we we're gonna include an outcome from item number four about air quality anyway. So maybe just hold on that. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then moving on. So um, natural systems number five, item number five, so uh, natural systems five is water in the environment. Hmm. Local action number five is create an education campaign about ambient water quality, pollution prevention, mitigation, and restoration techniques. So again, that would I, I would think we might combine, be able to combine that with um, the education piece from natural systems three. Are, Dora, are you putting that whole all those that like as a separate grouping of education pieces combining that? Yep, good idea. That's good. Yep. And then receiving six votes. Now here's the tricky part. Receiving six votes is action item one, two, six, seven, and eight. So that would bump us up to like 20 local actions. Mm -hmm. So um, let's look at those. Natural systems uh, five is uh, the water again. One is conduct a watershed health and vulnerability assessment of local waterways. Hmm. Um, fairly certain that is being monitored by the county as well. Is it not? Yeah. Yes, actually by the FTEP state. and the Southwest Florida Water Management District, mm -hmm. so both uh, state agencies. Um, so something to consider maybe Sidebar. sidebarring that item. Um, number two, adopt a watershed management plan that integrates natural water bodies with human uh, use and addresses inputs and outputs of the water system. Again, um, I'm not sure what already exists in terms of a watershed management plan, but I'm fairly certain that Swift Mud has something to that effect, correct? Yes. Um, item number six is provide incentives to residents and developers to protect and restore critical watershed protection areas. Um, so maybe that's something we would wanna keep in. Number seven is engage in restoring and maintaining critical water bodies and the buffer zones that protect those water bodies, which I think works kind of what we're doing with the creating the buffers oh. along the waterways. Um, and then eight is routinely inventory and monitor natural water bodies for biological, chemical, and hydrological integrity. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure the water keepers is, keeps that data as well as Swift Mud. Yes, that's part of our uh, stormwater program. We report as part of our permit, our water quality, and we partner with the county to do that effort. And do you do it in natural water bodies, like in the bayou, to make sure? Yes. And that's been a real issue, right? People getting sick. So if we include all of the items besides the ones that we've kind of put a pin in, um, in terms of like the plans, which is there a plan that we and when I say plan, I'm talking about action item number one on a lot of these that say like conduct a plan or create a plan um, that we may look at keeping in or leaving out. My preference is for natural systems one where it says green infrastructure, um, assess That's the second one, create a community-wide green infrastructure plan that's integrated with other relevant local plans. That would be my plan that I would prefer to keep in if we're going to 
uh, keep one of the four. The, the second major plan or the, you know, the requires a lot of action is in natural systems two, which is biodiversity and invasive species, create a plan of management for local species that minimizes damage from invasive species and enhances biodiversity and ecosystem services. You're, are you whittling down the whittled down priorities that we've already done? Is that what so I hear? What I did was I put a circle around those items that are like create a plan of management or mm -hmm. you know like a big plan and those are in natural systems one two three and five so if you want to look at the chart here so do you think that you we could now that things have been sort of uh, scaled down maybe we could get a, a list of all of that and look at it for next time. So, because going back and forth like this, I'm, sure, I can't see it, but sure. it'd be good to see if we have a plan and which are the big items and which are the smaller items. And um, because I, for me, the discussion we've been having is very helpful. Sure. Um, in terms of seeing what the priorities should be. And, and we can also see how they're interconnected. Mm -hmm. um, and what what ones we may want to eliminate or combine um, and think about costs and um, how big a plan it is. Um, but I think looking at it together would help. Okay. Thoughts on that? Are we okay with that? Okay, so I've taken some notes. I'll share. I'm sure that <laughs> Ashley and Paul have been taking good notes over there um, to get to y'all the whittle down list and then maybe what we still kind of want to talk through for next time. But at least we've got pretty much <laughs> natural systems done. <laughs> That's, you know, prioritized. Oh. So right. We can here, here. see that. Okay. All right, so let's move along then to, I'm gonna stop my screen share. Um, so um, the next item on the agenda is next steps for the sustainability action plan. So Paul, can you kind of walk us through quickly what you um, plan on having? Yes, so the idea was I mentioned earlier that our original outline we had a chapter five, which was focus areas and that's the heart of the sustainability action plan. And that's as the name implies, these are the details of what we're going to focus on. And um, now that we've got this framework it's really going to be this these items we're working on tonight they'll actually show up in that section of the plan almost verbatim to what we're talking about now so that's the good part is this is a lot of heavy lifting now but the payoff is we don't have to come up with brand new language for our focus areas it's already been developed and it's based on an, a workable working uh, demonstrated system so um talking with dory she suggested perhaps we do the first uh focus area of the report just to show you all what it's going to look like so you can kind of see this gets back to dr mickett's suggestion let's take some small steps of success to help motivate us um so i think um, dory's guided us through uh getting a lot done tonight on natural systems so i recommend that that's what we'll do we'll take this natural systems with these um outcomes and actions that have been slimmed down and list these and show you how it would look in the plan. Now, I'm, I'm promising you a lot here and that's without me sitting down and doing it yet, but uh, that's the idea. Yep. So next month we can start to see what it'll Great. look like. That'd be fabulous. All right. Um, have oh, pictures? I'm sorry? I said, can we have pictures? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can we add some pictures, Paul? <laughs> Animations? <laughs> Maybe the graph, maybe like a start of what a <laughs> skeleton graph for like the way that St. Pete has. Okay. Okay. 
Um, so our next item is the presentation to the Board of Commissioners. So I started this past month putting together a presentation that was part of the backup. So hopefully everybody took a look at that ahead of time and we can just kind of fly through this. And then if you have things that you would like me to add to the presentation, or if you have things that you want me to take out of the presentation, please let me know. And then the idea is for me to come back to you next month with those, with that feedback so that we can then, so then we'll be in April and then be able to present to the commission uh, either May or June. So this is your time for input, but then also know that we've got a month, you know what I mean? Like in between, if you think of something and would like to add it, then we'll look at it again mm -hmm. next month. And, and be able to add a little bit or tweak it a little bit before it goes to the commission. Dory, could you talk a little bit about the strategic plan and aligning the sustain, you know? Yes. I don't know anything about the strategic plan. Yep. Uh, between Paul and I, hopefully <laughs> we've got enough to be able to, to answer that. So um, I'm gonna share my screen again so that we can just look at it together. Um, Okay, so the um, we're starting off similarly to what we did last year with just explaining who the committee members are and how COVID kind of interrupted our work, but that we're back at it, um, that we meet monthly, um, and then start talking about the work that we have finished to date. So we've got the sustainability webpage that has all of the additions to it, um, and then the bang the table that they you know are aware of. We also um, have started working on our action plan. So we're going to share that with them. Oh, that was one other thing, Paul. Um, we had talked about also um, that introduction and trying to rework that. Is that something that you think maybe by next month or not yet? I think the introduction is going to really change. Yeah. And um, this is something that's hopefully not surprising to everyone, but I think we've developed a great deal of knowledge in the last six months. Um, I think we drafted that about six months ago. And um, so I really think we're going to want to make that introduction match up more with the focus areas that we uh, end up with. So it's probably going to have more star references because back when we wrote that, we didn't really have a framework yet. Yeah. I think the good news is a lot of those areas, if you remember, it was like sea level rise, um, shorelines, heat index, heat islands, public health. I mean, all these areas are still in the STAR framework. So it's not like that's all gonna be lost, but I think it's gonna be reorganized. So short answer, I don't think I'll be quite ready to give you a new section one yet. Okay. I'd say let's focus on the section five, how sure. that's gonna look. and. Usually when I write reports, you, you kind of work on the meat part and then you end up working on the introduction executive summary last because um, it really needs to guide you towards the, the main part of the report. I just kind of wanted to bring it up because I think it was originally like 30 pages is what we put all together. And that's gonna be condensed more down to like one and a half. <laughs> so just to not freak anybody out that, that's, yeah. that, that Paul is gonna be the one to help us edit that way down, so. Um, okay, so back to back to this. So again, explaining the idea of what a sustainability action plan is. I'm not sure if all of the commissioners are on that were there last year, but just want to make sure that we're doing that ongoing education, um, and then explain the framework and um, what it is, how we're using it, how it's you know a, a guiding document, um, and um, what the different goal areas are. And then also um, explaining the work completed to date that we've done as a committee. So we sent out the did you know uh, mailer in the utilities. Um, we sought input uh, originally with the um, with the C um, grant folks and the um, IFAS to help get some community input initially that helped kind of guide where we were going with the sustainability action plan and those initial um, community listening sessions. And then we also have started, um, not we, staff have started collecting a lot of the um, baseline data that will help us make decisions. So 
they've, um, and they presented to us about the greenhouse gas data um, and about water trends in the city. Um, and then we also had the presentation about um, baseline data for open spaces. Um, and then also work that we've done is the, the Duke um, uh, Renewable Energy Program that we've asked to participate in and um, start you know, using um, renewable energy. We also had the FICA document that we sent um, that the Board of Commission took the recommendation and sent that letter to the Public Service Commission mm -hmm. and then partnered with staff for the tree giveaway. And that'll have happened by the time we do that presentation. Mm -hmm. So we've, I'm kind of excited about like all of the things that we got done this past year. I mean, it really is quite a, quite a laundry list when you start to add it all up. And then uh, move on to work in progress. So we're completing um, staff is that vulnerability assessment and action plan that Paul has been talking about. Um, so also um, providing input to planning and zoning, the way that we are going to now, we're giving feedback as we go uh, at, at the end of the um, sustainability action plan, as, as we are finished going through the different um, goal areas in the framework. And then this is where you're asking Paul about aligning the sustainability action plan with the comp plan, um, with the strategic plan with the and with the and completing our action plan. So my my understanding is that the city um, had two options with creating a strategic plan. One was to go through um, St. Pete College. It was more of a self paced uh, kind of activity. The other is to go through the University of South Florida where they're the facilitator. They're the ones leading the conversation, pulling staff in with gathering baseline data, kind of like what we're doing with our action plan, going through a series of exercises with them, as well as getting feedback from key. And this is where you'll see in our recommendations, but getting feedback from not just our committee, but other committees that are advisory to the city about their priorities for um, for the city. So it's this gonna be this whole, how I'm not sure how many, maybe six month process of, of creating a strategic plan for the city. It's basically taking the comp plan and then prioritizing what are the action items that we wanna do most. So instead of working on like 18 different things all at the same time, it'll help the commission to align with what the highest and best use of time is and then be working through those uh, in sequence. Is that kind of correct in the way that I've characterized it? And is that? Yeah, I'll also add the um, commission got a presentation from staff on this and um, the direction so far is they're very interested in the USF approach and they wanted more information on cost so that they could discuss that for possible uh, direction forward. Oh. Hmm. Um, so moving on, future recommended projects and goals. So this is what we're now our recommendations to, to the commission would be, is to um, review the proposed land development code amendments for recommendations relating to promoting sustainability. So that's what we're still going to be doing. And then aligning the comprehensive plan and the strategic plan with sustainability items. Mm -hmm. Dory, if I can interrupt, it is actually 7.57. Okay, can I entertain a motion to extend the meeting past eight o'clock? Move to extend the meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Aye. Um, so moving on, um, also future recommended projects and goals, that community engagement that we know and want is going to be really valuable to, um, putting our um, action plan together, um, looking at bang the table opportunities to solicit feedback. And then hopefully as COVID starts to wane, maybe having some in-person um, community engagement opportunities. Also um, recommendation to the board of commissioners to fund the sustainability efforts that we're talking about. So we need to get them on board with the idea that some of these things are not going to be free um, and that they're going to cost money. So um, one of the things that I've included in here is also creating a full-time um, staff position to fund the work. 
Um, and like I said to Paul and Ashley, this is not in any reflection of the, the work that I think that they've been doing with us because I think that they are valuable like partners and they're the ones that are really doing a lot of the work that's making this happen. Um, so my, my intent with this is to like, in addition to that, have a full-time um, position. Mm -hmm. um, and then also continuing to look at consultants for some of the work like uh, Dr. Robinson, the, the presentation that you had with the um, um, analysts from, um, I think it was, was Academy, who was talking about, she presented. Um, Sharon Bolter? Yes. Um, yeah, Dr. Bolter is uh, with, um, uh, an international um, uh, engineering, civil engineering group um, based in, in, in uh, the Netherlands, but it has a strong base uh, here in, in, in Florida. Um, and she is also with the Florida Hurricane Hub. Okay. Uh, and, and with um, uh, other uh, educational institutions in, in South Florida, which is where she trained. Yeah. By the way, um, she and I are invited to duplicate that presentation to the BOC um, April 13th. Okay, good. So they'll have some oh, right. understanding of what we're talking about when we say looking at consultants for some of the work. Um, and then also continuing to look for university assistance. Um, you know, with the um, Recovery Act, there are dollars that are being uh, allocated for local governments. So, you know, the, there's money to be doing this work. And I think that the city needs to be funding it. Mm -hmm. um, and also just ensuring that there's skin in the game so that when we go to apply for funding, those funders understand that we're serious about the actions that we're taking as a city mm -hmm. um, around sustainability. So any feedback on, on that? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, the word sustainability has become a sort of buzzword. Okay. And I really feel like we need to say what that means. Like we talk about a sustainability plan. Well, what is sustainability? And I think that um, I might be hard pressed to actually say what that is. And if I'm having a hard time, I figure other people are having a hard time. And it seems like we should be really clear on what that means. So that's a great point. And um, last year we had the same conversation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I need to add that slide back in. Um, sustainability and resiliency, both, I think. Um, it's in the Pinellas paint plan too. I it think is. Right front page. Mm -hmm. And Definitely. yeah, and thank you, Denise, for saying that, because that's what I was going to recommend that we just use the same uh, lexicon as the county, because totally. why right. not? So, okay, so let me... Um, like when you have, what is a sustainability plan? It could go in there, right? As one of the, the first bullet or something, <laughs> just to say what... New slide, there we go. Which is page five, I guess. Dory, while you're adding that, uh, I did get that Paul motion to extend the meeting, but who was it seconded by? Is it Denise? Denise, I think. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I just added that slide in. I think that's a great point. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> Again, because like we were like, yeah, we did that last year, but <laughs> for those that have not or were not part of it, thank you. Yeah, redundancy doesn't hurt with this. Mm -hmm. Sure does not. Um, so any other thoughts about that? Any of this? Okay. And then the last is um, so that I just want to reiterate that when um, they're looking at the strategic plan, that they actually have an input place for us to be able to give meaningful input um, and, and for them to be thinking that on the front end, that, that we would like to be able to to. Uh, interface with them and make sure that there's some way for us to that, that that we would like the opportunity to do that. Is that consensus amongst the group that we would like to be able? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then ensure that the like you were saying before that the, the strategic plan would be prioritizing sustainability and resiliency. Um, 
that uh, we are becoming a more sustainable community by enhancing our city's environment, economy, and equity, protecting our natural resources for future generations to grow, environmental stewardship across the community, and prepare for the impacts of climate change through proactive resiliency planning, mitigation, adaptation. And that's all I have. So if there's anything else that Anybody, anybody have any heartburn with anything that's on here or think that it's something else is significantly missing? Well, I think your last bullet there, prepare for the impacts of climate change through proactive resiliency, that is that that can't be said enough times. That's great. Mm -hmm. It's Good. great to end there. Okay, well then, if you do th um, think of something else, um, happy to add that in, and also happy to add in more images. I realize that it's very ugly and uh, dialogue heavy. So um, I just, for example, the presentation on greenhouse gas emissions, I just added this screenshot from one of the slides. But if you have other ideas for to make this visually more appealing, I was just trying to get it done. So, <laughs> but you know, pictures worth a thousand words. So ideas well you efficient. know the thing about tarpon springs is we're surrounded by water so any images of water you know oh. the bayous mm -hmm. the sponge docks the whatever i mean it, it's that's just urgency right there yeah there's a great aerial shot that the city uses sometimes it shows the bayou and the river and everything of the whole city mm -hmm. that's a copyright free thing okay that's a good idea Possibly even the picture that you used um, a long time ago on the turn turn the tide. It had the flooded area of Dodo Kinesis. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Would it be useful to you to include? um some of the fema interactive map uh, information about projected flooding over time given mm -hmm. you know one foot two foot three feet of sea level to, to put pictures mm -hmm. with this where would you um recommend that i put that like add it as a new slide yeah. or okay yeah. just to illustrate mm -hmm. what we're looking at down the line okay are we all okay with that yes absolutely okay trying to take good notes so i remember what i'm talking about when i look at these tomorrow okay anything else all right so then moving on to item number six items for the next agenda so I would love to be able to uh, just everybody, I'm just a reminder to keep your running list of priorities for land development code updates as we're going through these. Um, and then also next month, I would like to be able to get through, well, we'll review natural systems, where we're at with that, with the new shortened abbreviated list and kind of try to decide what we wanna do with that. Um, and then, do the next um, climate and energy. Yeah, climate and energy. So if you have not already given your priorities to Ashley, please uh, send her your climate and energy. And, and now that you've kind of, we've gone through this together, maybe revise some of your thinking about some of this with like thinking through like the cost factor and, you know, trying to combine this with other things that we're already doing. Um, so climate and energy. And then um, I think that that's probably enough, honestly, to get us <laughs> to be able to, to talk through those meaningfully and get through both of those. And then we'll do a review of the um, presentation to the BOC with those edits and um, like, last call for any other edits mm -hmm. and i think that that's probably enough i mean I'm, if anybody wants to add anything else to that mm -hmm. speak now 
You know, one thing is um, when you talk about the tree giveaway, when you mentioned the list of accomplishments and the tree giveaway that's happening, it, um, I would like, would like to know the final count of trees that were given away. Okay. Hmm. All right. So then we're next item on the agenda is public comments. There's somebody here in person. Is there anybody um, that's joined us via Zoom? We do not have any attendees on Zoom. We do not have any attendees on Zoom. I don't see anybody on the attendee list. I'm looking at the Zoom call now. Mark or Mike, is there anybody on Zoom that I'm missing somehow? Nope, okay, very good. All right, so the next uh, item is staff comments. I don't really have a whole lot to add. I think we covered a lot tonight. I've talked probably a lot tonight. Ashley? Uh, I do not have anything to add. All right, committee comments. I, I, I just want to thank you, Dory, for all the work you do. It's quite impressive. And to keep us on track and all your preparation. And so, I mean, really, thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'd like to counter that with a thank you to all of you guys for really being engaged. This is like so much work and I very much recognize that. So thank you all for, for getting your input and for you know having a great conversation tonight and very thoughtful and um, very much appreciated. And I also really wanna thank again, Paul and Ashley for all of their work that they're doing so much behind the scenes to get us to <laughs> this point. Um, that it's very much appreciated. Um, Bravo. Yeah. And uh, yeah, any other comments? Uh, this is, this is going to sound totally off the wall. Bear with me. Uh, on Sunday, Michael League and the band Snarky Puppy won their fourth Grammy award. This was for the best contemporary instrumental. Um, and yesterday on National Public Radio, the same band leader, Michael League, was interviewed on uh, by Rachel Martin for a single song that he wrote as part of a, a personal album as he was in quarantine in Spain um, called The Last Friend. And the Last Friend perceives of death appropriate to our pandemic, not as the Grim Reaper, but as a lifelong companion. And the final friend that you have is at the end of your life. Why does that matter? Because Michael's grandfather, Henry Kelly, was the first really well-recognized band director of the city of Tarpon Springs. Mm -hmm. And he and his bands really kind of put music scene, at least high school and, and junior high school level, on the map uh, nationally. Mr. Ford has continued that tradition and, and really raised it so that now, as we all know, Tarpon Springs bands are, are really are, you know, nationally known, if not internationally known, you know, in the top five all the time. So the music transferred through the, you know, the daughter to the grandson and Michael is an international musician and his band is internationally renowned. His brother, Patrick, um, did his dissertation at Harvard in musicology based upon music from Crete, Kalymnos, et cetera, being brought to this country through this city. Mm -hmm. And that's his dissertation. He is now an assistant professor of musicology at Florida State. It speaks to the richness uh, and, and the, the, the depth 
just one aspect of Tarpon Springs. It gets music from lots of different directions, but Tarpon really punches above its weight in terms of band music, but not just band music. Bertie Higgins, et cetera, I could talk and talk and talk about that. But it, it speaks to, I think, um, you know, the depth of culture, just one piece of the depth of culture of our city. Mm -hmm. Just had to say that. Very interesting. And also part of sustainability. I mean, like one of the, you know, outcomes is arts and culture. So being able to keep those traditions alive is really important. So I know we've been thinking a lot about natural systems and we're going to talk about climate or energy and, um, and climate, but keeping that thought process about, you know, what what it really means to be sustainable is all of those things. So thank you for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Mm -hmm. Well, I'd just like to also thank um, Paul and Ashley for their work. Um, this past month, the um, electric vehicles came up uh, for the board approval and um, those were both approved. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I really, I mean, like hats off to Paul because he, you know, heard their comments in December, heard the concern, and then really worked hard to address all of those concerns. Um, and now we've got two EVs coming in the fleet um, because of that. So thank you, Paul, for that. I, I spoke, but not uh, on behalf of the of our sustainability committee because we hadn't discussed that ahead of time. So I, I just spoke as like a professionally as an EV advocate, but um, but just so that you guys know if you go back and look at the commission meeting um but paul did a really exceptional job getting that work through so thank you for your hard work on that thank you for recognizing that. i just want to take a minute to make sure everyone knows it was really a city effort um many departments got involved and this is what i was mentioning earlier this committee is really having a ripple effect on our staff um to get that done dory had some great ideas that we implemented and one of them was you can capture that federal tax credit even though we're a governmental ed entity, if we do a third party lease. So that we'd never done anything like that before. We got with the finance director, the procurement department, the city attorney was involved, fleet from public works. It was quite a concerted effort to get that item together. But in the end, we recommended something to save uh, $13,000 if we hadn't had done it that way. And uh, it, we just tried to make it as easy for the commission to approve as possible, and they, they recognize that. So it's an important first step for the city to have some electric vehicles in the fleet to Nissan Leafs. And uh, we are planning that this is just the beginning. And as the market really starts to uh, rev up mm -hmm. with these sorts of things, you know, pretty soon it'll be pickup trucks and, <laughs> you know, we can really make a difference. Mm -hmm. All right, if there aren't any other um, comments then, uh, I'd like to entertain a motion to adjourn at 8.17. Well, please come to our show. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. At uh, Creative Pinellas. And um, we'll be having um, three science panels. Um, the first one on what's climate change and sea level rise. And then the second on uh, what you and I can do. And Libby's gonna be on it about um, electric vehicles. And the last one is about what um, a green society looks like. And these are all with um, well known established scientists. And there's a whole bunch of other science and environmental things. So um, and they're all, they're all listed in that brochure. And I'll send out announcements with um, panelists and headshots and bios and all of that as we um, get them ready. Can we put that on the on our sustainability page? You read my mind. <laughs> Is that something that we could do? I mean, it's in conjunction with Creative Pinellas. So um, if we can, I think that would be great. And then um, maybe even if um, the city who does the social media for the city, if we could get a couple tweets or uh, Facebook posts about the event, mm -hmm. I think that that would help to amplify. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the event and, and if I'll we send could it to the city and and then if you could send it to each of us then you know we could all put it on our social media channels as well huh? i know i'd be happy to be great no and mention that one of our members is 
artist, right? Make that link. Yep, absolutely. Yep. And the great thing about going to Creative Pinellas is it's in the same um, complex as the um, Botanical Gardens, the county for botanical, which is really wonderful, mm -hmm. and Heritage Village. So it's a beautiful place just to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, well then, with that, is there is there any other? <laughs> I didn't mean to cut anybody off. I feel bad. <laughs> okay, so then it's eight nineteen. Uh, if I could uh, entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting, please. Uh, second the motion. Oh, I can't make it. So. So I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, second. All in favor? <laughs> all right, meeting adjourned. All right. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. Have a Thank great you. month.